Hi everybody. Uh, welcome to my live. I'm taking questions as always. Hold on, this light is a little crazy. Let me turn it down. Oh, there we go. That's better. That's more normal. I'll wait till some of you show up. I don't start today till a little bit later. So, oh, I see one person watching. Always send me likes and stars if you see this because... That's what gets people to see Dr. Psych Mom. And if you love me, then you want other people to see me too. And thank you. Already I got a like. So you guys are catching on quick today. Uh, you could send as many likes as you can. I was going to talk in this about any questions you have about the stage of life where women are in their 40s. So this is when perimenopause starts. So the um, lessening of hormones that precedes menopause, average age of menopause. What is wrong today with the light? Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Average age of menopause is 52. So that starts around 10 years before your estrogen starts dropping. Things start to feel different. You know, um, it's harder to have an orgasm for many women. You just don't give a shit about a lot of the things you used to. Your priorities change. You are not in a young mother stage anymore, you know, um, for most women, unless you had started having kids much later. And even then, there are not a lot of 40-year-old moms of young kids who feel like young moms anyway, because you're not. You're in midlife. And so this can change the dynamic of the marriage. And send your likes if you're watching and if you're interested in this topic. And, of course, you can always give me your questions. You can say hi. I love to see who's watching by you saying hi. I can't see otherwise. Um, and so a lot of guys say, why doesn't she seem to really care about me the same way? Well, there's two reasons. One, I mean... There are stages in life, you know, and when she's kind of obsessed with you and obsessed with making babies is a younger stage, you know, and she may be interested in her career and volunteering and travel in friends. I mean, there's just so many things. Also, if the marriage wasn't very happy and she was a preoccupied attachment partner that was always running after you, then when she gets to her 40s, she doesn't want to do that anymore. So frequently, she either decides to leave when the kids leave the house or just leave or just leave emotionally and just assume that you guys are kind of a partnership of co-parenting and you never really were that interested in being close from her perspective to begin with. So then why should she do it now? You know, when she literally hormonally doesn't give a shit the same way. Hello, Alan. Happy Friday to you. Everybody be like Alan. Alan just commented and you guys should comment too. 22 of you. I should have lots of likes right now. Um, so anyway, this stage often confuses men because they didn't realize what they were missing until it left. Melissa says, hi, you're very insightful. Thank you, Melissa. That's very nice. You should join our secret group. You're a nice person. Only join our secret group, by the way. That's the blue subscribe button if you're a nice person. We do not have trolls in that group. We do not have the guys on the main page who are super misogynistic. We don't have people that just start arguments for the sake of arguing, devil's advocates. So if you're disappointed with those comments on the main page, then go to the secret group because the paywall really keeps a lot of that out. So that's the blue subscribe button on the main page. Anyway, um, so yeah, you guys can give me questions about this topic. Many men are, as, as I was just saying, Many men don't know what they had till it's gone, kind of. They assume that the woman was kind of always going to be into the relationship, always be planning dates. Uh, the majority of date nights are obviously planned by women. I talk all the time about how, except on the internet, the average insecurely attached man is avoidant, you know? And he doesn't care as much about the relationship as she does. And that's just how it is in the world. On the internet, though, on relationship forums, not on forums about, like, their hobbies, which is where avoidant men love to go, but on forums about relationships, you're only going to see preoccupied attachment men, usually partnered with avoidant women, as I've taught you, right? And you could research, go, go to the Dr. Psych Mom show on Spotify and type attachment into the search bar within the show, the Dr. Psych Mom show, and you'll see all my stuff on attachment. And you could also type in avoidant. You know, so you could hear about avoidant husbands, which are more of the norm, and avoidant wives, which are less of the norm. But if you were just on the internet and relationship forums, you would be forgiven for thinking that every woman was avoidant and every man was preoccupied. In fact, that's a minority, but it's who you see on the internet because those are the guys who are going to follow a relationship specialist, right? Because they're interested in saving their relationship. They are the preoccupied attachment partner. 
But for every one of me that speaks to both genders, there's loads of people who speak to just one. And there's so many women following relationship gurus that just speak to women primarily about being with emotionally unavailable dudes because that's so common. Um, Stanislav here says, hi, wife is voided now even more than before. How does a guy deal with this stage? Um, you mean the stage I'm talking about where she's in her forties or fifties? Well, I mean the, a lot of couples therapy focuses on this and understanding and empathizing with each other. So a lot of guys take this personally, like, oh, like she's not having orgasms like she used to, uh, is that cause she's not attracted to me? No. Like, just like if you lose your hair, it's not because you're mad at her biology changes people, right? So your wife is at a different stage of life. Her priorities are shifting. It likely has zero to do with you. She, there are probably a few things that would make you feel better, such as having a little bit, at least a little bit more physical attention and intimacy and maybe having date nights or some, some time that's actually spent talking or hanging out. And she might be able to do that if she knows like those discrete things that you want that are very concrete. But usually guys in your situation just kind of hang around and say, you know, like, oh, it doesn't feel like it used to, or are you even into me anymore? And then those kind of insecure comments make her pull away even more because who really wants to deal with being kind of, um, you know, somebody up your butt, like complaining? Nobody really does. Uh, so I would say couples counseling would be very useful as my TLDR, Stanislav. And of course, any research that you can do about this, which would obviously include following me and all of my free resources. Um, I even have a podcast, How Women's Brains and Bodies Change in Their 40s, and um, that could be very useful for you on the Dr. Psych Mom Show. Anthony says, it's all fascinating. Thank you, Anthony. I am a fascinating person. No, obviously, this, this topic is fascinating, certainly. Uh, Renee says, my husband doesn't understand that him calling me names makes me dislike him. He called me a snobby bitch last night. Well, uh, that's unfortunate, you know, and name calling is probably what he saw growing up and a lot of high conflict. And he just thinks that shit that people do in relationships and it's not, and it's super toxic and, uh, you don't want your kids to be emulating that. And I would get into therapy yesterday, you know, and the second best is today. So obviously if there is any sort of name calling or insulting going on in your marriage, that is not healthy and it is almost always because that is the marriage that the person saw growing up and they assume that that's how people fight and people just fight in, in a nasty way and say nasty things and you don't know what you don't know. So a lot of times people are very surprised in therapy that I say that couples don't fight, healthy couples don't fight a lot because they grew up seeing couples that fought every single day. Uh, Alan said that's very disrespectful to his wife. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. And it's nasty. And it's probably, he got called a lot of names growing up, you know? And so he thinks that's how people interact, but it's not okay. Paul says, I'm in a relationship with a hugely avoidant woman. She is very special, but simply refuses to discuss any serious issues. Even when I raise them, there's a brick wall there. There are some significant issues to discuss. She's fine and calm and happy, but the elephants in the room simply cannot be addressed, such as contact with the ex, revelation that she cheated on her last partner, and social media contact with other men. And this is a huge blocker to communication and building a better, stronger relationship. All I see now is big red flags. Well, you are correct. Big red flags. You should be in therapy, Paul. The only reason that you would be putting up with any of this is because you have low self-esteem and you assume that this is how all women act, mostly because you saw that growing up as one partner disrespecting another. As I write in my post, most women don't cheat. Most women don't cheat. The ones that do usually have tremendous issues going on. But there's plenty of guys whose mom cheated or who saw cheating women in their relationships growing up. And then they think that all women cheat, you know? So then they get with the first woman who cheats and then the next woman who cheats and then the next woman who cheats. And then, and they go to on the internet rabbit hole talking about all women are terrible with other guys who had a similar experience who are the minority. So you don't have to put up with any of this, Paul. This seems terrible. And thankfully, you're just in a relationship, not a marriage. So you should be going to therapy to really talk about what the hell's going on here and why you're putting up with that, because it all sounds like you're correct. Big red flags. All right, and thank you for the likes. Everybody who's watching, please send a like or a love. Great questions, guys. All very interesting. And of course, if you are in a relationship where you feel like there's lots of big red flags, but you just won't leave, 
that's what you saw growing up was two people locked in eternal misery and you just assume that's what relationships are subconsciously working through that can help you a great deal that's how therapy can be transformative to understand that most people are not locked in a miserable marriage forever even though that may be what you saw anthony says 20 years 21 years married feels like yesterday we do argue occasionally i cannot imagine being like my parents of course, my mother's last marriage ended in a tragic murder-suicide. Whoa. I just don't understand how people could take that. Yeah, I saw fighting in the worst of five marriages. Vowed to be married once, and if it failed, never again. Well, I mean, you experienced a lot of stuff. It seems like you certainly have uh, tried to process and grieve a lot of what, you know, you experienced. And certainly, there are people that can move forward into healthy relationships. They usually require a lot of introspection, though, you know, as you may have done in order to break that cycle. Um, Melissa says, can a twin flame relationship stay healthy? I do not know what that is. I don't know that term. I think I have heard that before, but it is certainly not a psychology term. If you want to explain what it is, then I can answer that in a subsequent comment. Paul says, hi, thanks for addressing my comments. Much appreciated. I'm actually in a marriage and these issues arose after we wed. My parents had a stable and happy marriage. Okay. Well, this, this goes beyond the, again, my, my same advice applies. You see massive red flags in your relationship, massive red flags, including dishonesty and stonewalling. So therapy is necessary, or, you know, at least for just you and hopefully for the both of you to try to explore some of these. There can't be secrets. There can't be lies. All of these things are really unhealthy for a relationship. Uh, hold on. I got to block some, oh gosh. All right. Good. Uh, hi Martin. Thank you for commenting. Um, all right, great. I blocked somebody who was, you know, can't do this shit without harassment. Unfortunately, at least as a female, um, any other comments? This is going well. Send likes. If you're watching, that really does help me quite a bit. It helps support my page, the Dr. Psych Mom page. And you guys should all be watching, uh, listening to my podcast, which is available everywhere. Sometimes people only think that it's Spotify, but it's everywhere. Uh, Apple, Google, it's the Dr. Psych Mom show. Uh, Anthony says, truth, thank you. I'm so grateful for my wife. That is nice. Paul says, you validated what I know deep down. I needed that. Thanks. You are welcome. If anybody, like all of you listening, like if there is like a huge elephant in the room of your relationship, then you need to address that. Like you, you shouldn't be in secrecy. Like the marriage should not have these big secrets, dishonesties, like things that you're like scared to bring up. All that stuff is like really, really unhealthy. People deserve to be in an honest, open relationship with one another. And uh, if you can't, then that probably is, is, is a glaring sign that the relationship needs to be reconsidered or worked on or something uh stanislav says thanks for all the info you're putting out there it helped me a lot i'm glad to hear that thank you very much thanks for for watching and all of that so again my back to my main topic and of course i'll stop for any questions as i've been doing because that's way more fun so totally send all your comments but other things like i i talked about in a recent video benefits of um, perimenopause and menopause because it gets so much slack and bad, bad press. And in reality, a lot of women are very happy at this stage. Remember, happiness is a U-shaped curve. And after menopause, it starts going up and up and up for women. A lot of women are very happy to get rid of the ups and downs all month long. You know, especially if they struggle with mood issues like depression and PMS. It is like getting a, a monkey off your back, you know, which is an analogy that many men have used in my practice to describe what it's like to have a lessened sex drive over time. They felt like they were in their 20s. They were like just being completely ruled by their sex drive, you know, or their 30s even. And they really feel like a lot more rational without that tremendous burden of constantly thinking about that. And so the equivalent for women is not being ruled by your hormones the whole month. Um, Steph says, how oh, Anthony says trust is a foundation once broken it is never the same you're great thanks for doing these you're welcome Anthony thanks for participating Steph says how do we help our long-term partners deal with the changes of menopause specifically the shift in priorities and newfound focus on my own life instead of always being on the bottom of the list for the family and Anthony also says that is what I want to know more about my wife is entering perimenopause 
Yes, so as I discussed earlier in the live, and these are always recorded, so you'll see it in my um, in my uh, thing. I don't know how this guy is not banned. I just banned him. Um, but anyway, uh, so if you want to be helpful and useful to your partner during this stage, you have to understand that they're a separate person from you, and they will have separate priorities and all stages of life are valid. You know, there are positives and negatives to every single stage of life. It is as ridiculous to, to think of your wife's menopause as only negative as to think of your daughter's puberty as only negative. Nobody would do that, you know? Nobody would be like, oh my God, my daughter's going through puberty. She's not going to be a little girl. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm not going to let her out with her friends and I'm going to make her play with Barbies. So I think that's a good way to compromise. No, that would be called child abuse, right? And it's really not much different when the woman is moving on to different things in her life and you're saying, no, you got to act exactly like you did when you were 35. How? That's not who she is. Often that woman feels like her daughter. The woman that you met feels like her daughter, you know? And so this isn't to say, of course, it's not ethical to unilaterally end physical affection and also tell your partner they can't get it elsewhere. That's like a, a different, I have a post coming out on arrangements that people use if one person is truly completely done with, with sex and just doesn't want it at all. But in most healthy marriages, the person's drive, it just goes down. They don't have the same priority, but they don't like completely cut off the other partner. It turns into a new compromise, you know, a new compromise. Same as having kids. Like talk about, you know, a cock block, right? Having children please like you can barely have sex you can't literally have sex for six weeks after after having kids they they're up all night they sleep in your bed a lot i mean having kids is like the worst decision for a sex life ever yet it's a normal stage that most people want to go through you know and perimenopause and menopause is the same literally a life stage a change woman isn't fertile anymore so she is needed in other ways there's research on menopause in chimps and in whales and that the women who are post-menopause who are not fertile the females whales and chimps they have other uh roles such as telling the whales telling the pod where places are to eat that the woman remembers because of her older age by the woman i mean the woman whale um and a lot of human women have the same sort of thing they there's a quote that I read about menopause and it's um as a woman's babies get older her ears turn from the suffering of of her babies to the suffering of the world and I'm mangling that but generally it means that women are more interested in greater society their career volunteering politics their church etc um hold on okay let me see what percent of women have their sex drive go up at, after menopause? I mean, I don't know what percentage of them get divorced because then they get into a honeymoon stage with somebody else. But I mean, sometimes that uh, goes along. And of course, that recedes after the couple years, too. But sometimes the kids leave the house and then the woman can like actually have more sex and be more relaxed, especially if she was an anxious person before. But actually having your sex drive go up with your monogamous partner at the time of life where you're experiencing vaginal atrophy and in, and like not being able to have a baby anymore. I mean, I've never heard of it. There are women on the Internet and who knows if they're even women who compulsively comment, you know, that their sex drive is like way higher at like 70 than ever before. I mean, that's like the guys who say they're in better shape at 70 than ever before. Like, I just like, that's nothing I've seen in the natural world that would have no evolutionary basis. Uh, however, if women go on hormone, uh, you know, hormonal things like hormone replacement therapy, especially with testosterone, then they can have a higher drive than they used to because they're getting their hormones replaced, right? And frequently those hormones are then at higher levels than they used to be because it's an inexact science. So that can happen. But in terms of a net, like, like, think about it. Like, that's like saying like, well, what percent of 90 year old women are in better shape than 60 year old women? Like things just go one direction, you know? Uh, Glenn Murdoch, my wife has diabetes and has been in severe pain within a course. No give up on sex for the last years of 39 year marriage, total give up on sex. And I have severe ED issues as well. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, if you, you can always reach out to somebody at our practice and they can work with you. I'm not exactly sure what the issues, 
you, I mean, there's a lot of issues going on there. So, I mean, you probably want to work with a sex therapist or talk to your doctor too. There seems like there's medical issues. I'm certainly not a medical doctor. I am a PhD. Anthony says, I was listening to a podcast where they were discussing this. And one woman said, I'm closed for business and open for pleasure. I thought that was great as my wife and I have a very solid sex life. Yeah. And like people that are in healthy relationships keep having sex. It may not be intercourse because her vagina may hurt, but it may be cuddling and massage and there could be stimulation, you know, of whatever sort. So most people in a healthy relationship do shit that they don't really necessarily want to do if they were alone, but they could get into it. That's responsive desire. So, you know, if a woman loves her husband, even if she doesn't have any desire at all, she'll probably, you know, try to get in the mood, even if it's so much harder, even if an orgasm is not possible anymore, even if she's really not kind of that interested, she loves him. It's the same as she would go to him with him to a play and sit through two hours of a play if she didn't like plays. You know, it's just kind of the person that you're with. If you're with a more agreeable, loving, positive person, they're going to do stuff, you know, they're going to hang out and, and be physically intimate or not or whatever. The point is, is that if, if you guys, if, if there are men and there are men who are waiting for the woman to somehow just like not go through a natural change of life, it would be as silly as expecting a child not to become a teenager. That's, that's when your hormones turn on and perimenopause and then fully menopause is when your term hormones turn off. So they begin and they end. That, so remember, the first period is called menarche, and then the last one is called menopause. That's two sides of the same coin. The woman's whole life is not, is, is, is not that. That's the fertile period in that mammal's life. But there's other life before and after that, and those stages are just as valid and just as natural. Steph says this, and men seem to struggle when the focus shifts from the man and his life that she helped build to herself and her own life feels unfair that they got to be selfish while the woman built the family. Then when it's her turn to be selfish, it's a problem for him or unfair to the family. Well, Steph, I mean, couples therapy can help him understand, you know, but also this is why there are high rates of gray divorce. You know, once you have raised the kids, if your husband is, is very unsupportive, you know, then many women don't really find a need to stay. And that's okay. If you're unhappy and you don't have kids at home, I don't see much of a reason to stay right? Two people to fight until they die. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, certainly therapy would be useful. This is a massive thing that women are in therapy for is how they change. You know, I just hired another clinician at Best Life that's going to specialize in more the perimenopause and menopause issues. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's a huge thing. And as I myself have gotten into my 40s and I'm 42, it's, it is a change. It's like a total change. You know, you're you don't have the same priorities anymore. The priorities used to be like bath time. Like that's very, very different when you have teenagers. Like that would be pretty fucking weird for your priority to be bath time if your kid is like 13, you know. It just can't be anymore. Like going to the zoo, like going on these little excursions, like snacks. Like I used to think so much about snacks, you know. And it's like, I never think about snacks anymore. You know, like, I just don't think about snacks. Those look huge. Like, there's so many little examples like that. Bedtime, books. So do I have enough books in the house? Like, it's so different. They read their books. Sometimes I'll share a book. Sometimes I'll get a book for my teenage daughter. But it used to be a whole thing. I used to get, like, lots of board books from eBay. You know, and the more that a woman used to be a stay-at-home mom, and I only worked 10 hours a week when I had little ones until my last child weaned, um, it, it's even more of a focus. Your entire life felt like it was about little kids and maintaining like a happy marriage with little kids. And then all of a sudden they go to school and it's totally different. And when they become teenagers, it's, it's like you could see very obviously that they are going to leave, you know, soon. In less than a decade, they're going to be out of the house. And then what? And so many, many women start to focus on things that are a different level of priority to them, such as their own career is like a massive one for many women. Or, I mean, friendships, I mean, for, for bigger extroverts, right? Going out on girls trips, reconnecting with old friends, being part of clubs and societies and whatever, uh, professional associations, like travel, you could go to conferences again because you don't have little kids that you have to put to bed every night, a lot of things like that. So it is, it is, the woman frequently gets to have the career then that the man had earlier on. 
So you're right, Steph. You know, a lot of women say that. He got to have his career. Now I want to have my career. And sure, that is fair. And and men that are healthy, just like the, I just said, healthy women post-menopause won't just cut their man off from sex completely, right? Because she's being a good wife. And a good husband will take his turn in allowing you to spread your wings more. Hi, Roger. Thanks for saying hi. Um, any questions, Roger, from you or for anybody? Uh, any to- This is a really interesting topic, and thankfully it's getting more and more What's the word? More press, as I said before, women are finally talking about things like menopause and perimenopause. It used to be very, very taboo to talk about that, periods, PMS, like all of this stuff. Like nobody ever used to talk about that stuff and now they do. So it's wonderful. And it's a natural stage of life, natural transition. Everything is not always about the primary intimate relationship, you know? John here says the perimenopause and menopause discussion gets more depressing every time you have it. I think it gets more interesting every time I have it. It's less depressing to me, but I'm sorry that it's upsetting to you. It's clearly great for people who have low libido anyway, but it's cold comfort for those who don't. Gray divorce is depressing too. No, I think you misunderstood. So, or maybe I misspoke. Women who have a higher libido, they certainly like mourn the loss of the libido, but it's just kind of like how you mourn having little kids. You know, there's other things coming now you know, down the pike. It's not like, you know, it's like that quote, I'm not religious, but whenever God closes a door, he opens a window or something like that. Um, You know, it's, there are other stages of life that many women find extremely fulfilling. Again, the, the happiness U curve after 60, it goes straight up, you know, even I think a little earlier, but maybe not, but either way, it's, Finally, feeling free, like, and there's other stuff that women feel freed from, like the constant body image bullshit, you know, that I used to think about, oh my God, just constantly like, you know, how do I look and am I the right weight? Am I the right shape? And blah, 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 and the skin and the hair and the hair removal. And oh my God, clothes, you know, and like a lot of women are like, fuck it. I don't care. You know, like it's so relieving and liberating to feel very differently about it, to not want to get on the scale every day and feel like shit if you were like a pound up or pound down, you know, and I have a, a, a article about nine things women think about all day and to be freed from a lot of the anxiety of some of those. How's my relationship? Does, does he really love me? Does he think about me? How do I look? Is it because I don't look good enough? Is it because I'm fat? Am I fat? Am I this? Am I that? You know, getting past that can be amazing. Really, really, like, liberating is the word. Um, Anthony says, wow, I think there's a major misconception about the menopause thing. Yes, there are so many misconceptions. Like, some people think it just means that, like, your whole life is over. But yet that is nothing that actually concords with happiness research. In fact, older women are happier than younger women. Um, And every woman is different. That is certainly true. Every woman is different. Uh, Aaron Trainer says, what's next? Death? It's depressing. Well, yes. I mean, and, and people used to be close, like, understand this more. Cycle of life stuff. Like, every time, and that's my big joke that I say every time, like, that a guy is like, oh, it's so depressing. That sex drive goes down over time. I say, wait till somebody tells you about death. <laughs> this is true. You know, it's a cycle of life. And when people were constantly around extended networks of friend, of family, and they were more attuned to, like, kind of, you know, a generation is born, another generation passes, people were more religious, you know, there was more believing the afterlife, etc. This used to be known, like people get older, like that's just a thing. But now people fight against it. And I have a whole podcast about this, if you're interested, um, is uh, why aging seems harder and harder for people on the Dr. Psych Mom show. Uh, and it says something like for my sociology fans. All right, let me see. And thank you for the likes. Send likes if you're watching. Hold on. Uh, Steph says depressing for men because women are only supposed to serve men. This is my big epiphany with the hormone shift. It's been depressing for me too. I didn't realize how oppressed women still are until I stopped playing the role I thought I was supposed to. Well, that realization feels common for many women, but that's not all women. If you were an over-functioner or pretty codependent with a guy, then this is going to come to you and hit you like a ton of bricks. So that's where individual therapy may help, Steph, because not every woman feels oppressed, obviously. You know, and um, but if you are in an over-functioner role, 
taking care of everything because otherwise you that's the role that you thought of like that that you were supposed to be in and probably the role you saw your mother in then that's going to feel salient to you but it's uh it, it's it's different for everybody and for every couple um okay roger says pursue her with patience is that like how to get yeah i mean just like anything women like to feel you know like the guys into it or but i mean somewhat less as they age but certainly they like romantic things still Megan says, I love your podcast. I'm a subscriber and my husband and I have learned so much from you. Thank you for your voice. Oh, you are welcome. That's very nice of you. You should join our Facebook group. You seem like a nice person. Every time somebody gives me a compliment, I'm like, oh, you seem great. Join our Facebook group. But that's true. Our Facebook group has nice people in it. Um, Anthony says, with every season, what is it? Turn, 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 turn. How does the song go? I'm the only one here and I can't sing that well. There is a reason, turn, 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 right? That's the song. Sorry, I can't help myself. Yep, that is true. Every season of life has its positives and its negatives. So just as it would seem, I had my freeze tag analogy. Kids don't want to play freeze tag anymore. Is that like super sad? Only if you're really depressive, right? <laughs> so like, yeah, you can look at your child not being a baby anymore and cry about it every single day. And honestly, a lot of women feel like that sometimes. But if you feel like that all the time, that's called depression. And it's called not focusing on the person that they are now. And it's the same thing with a waning of libido over time. Yes, you could say, oh my God, I'm not 25 years old anymore. I don't have multiple orgasms anymore. Or you could be like, well, you know, I was pretty depressed about shit when I was 25 too, and I don't have a lot of that shit to worry about. I'm at a different stage of life. Thank God I raised my kids. Thank God I've become successful in this way and that way. I'm more independent. I'm more confident. You know, I mean, it's every single stage has its positives and its negatives, and therapy can massively help with this. I help people. I guide people through this all the time. The changes that come with mortality, with aging. I mean, people are really scared of aging in our culture. Um, Anthony says, hold on, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything here on my calendar. I'm not. Anthony says, I've watched my wife evolve and I love her with every day. We get the privilege of aging together. Yeah, that's really nice. That's what my husband says too, that like he can't wait to grow old with me. And if you're a loving guy and you are there for her during this transition, it's not unlike the transition of having a young baby. You know you can't have sex with her much when she has a young baby, but most guys will still have a baby, you know, because it's like part of life. And like she wants it, you want it, you're growing into different people, you're becoming a mother and a father, it's a whole new role. I mean, just because you're not going to have sex anymore, it's like literally your entire life going to be about recreational sex? No. I make this analogy in a new podcast I have. Like, you know what else screws up sex lives? And so many people tell me this. Men working. Men working outside the home. So, but many men will not just transition into like a telecommuting job of some sort just because they would get laid more on lunch break. Maybe they have other things they want to do. The guy's a surgeon, let's say. He's not going to like transition into like a desk job because he could get laid more. He likes saving lives. That's a big part of his life. So even though he could get more sex if he was home during the day he can't be a surgeon if he's home during the day so that's a choice for his greater self-actualization that is meaningful to him that even though being a surgeon would get him laid less overall even though being a mother gets you laid less overall because you have a baby and then a child most people are still going to want to be a mother i mean it's just like there are other aspects to people's identities obviously Joe says, so it sounds like the husband, even if his libido is the same, first mistake, but I'll get back to that, just has to adapt. And even if he wants more sex, it's just acceptance. Well, first of all, humans of both genders age. And uh, I, I discussed this in a recent podcast that so many women say to me, like, he's not hard like he used to be. He doesn't have the refractory period he used to have, but somehow he keeps saying his sex drive is the same. Like, it's not, you know, sex doesn't feel the same or anything, but like, I'm supposed to pretend like it does. So women... Don't pretend. You're making it worse for other women, you know? So both men and women, obviously their sexual functioning changes over time. Some guys try to circumvent this with Viagra and stuff, but that still is not the spontaneous erection that you used to get. So you're not exciting her the same way that you used to either because people age and change, and that's just aging for a mammal or any species. But let's say magically, or let's say there's a big age difference, right? That's, a, that's one I could get better behind. 
So let's say that they met, he was 20, she was 30, and now she's 50 and he's 40. So he has, uh, you know, still much of his sex drive, not like when he was 20, but much of it. And uh, she's gone through menopause. What should he do? Well, that's when I talk about that a loving woman will not cut the guy completely off. You know, obviously they may have to renegotiate here because she has so much less drive, right? But isn't that the same? Like, what if anything happened? Like, what if she took a job that was like a couple hours away because that was like the best job ever? And then he didn't see her. You know, she was exhausted when she came home a lot of the time. But it was like, you know, her choice, right, to take that job. Yeah, I mean, they would talk about it, but like most guys wouldn't be like, no way, no how, can't double your salary because I need you resting from 7 p.m. on so that I can get laid by 8, right? I mean, things change in a couple. So yes, the only answer, by the way, if she doesn't want sex is you can't have sex with her. That is, of course, the only ethical answer. If that goes on over time and she's completely averse to any compromise because it's not a good relationship, then you could talk about either going your separate ways, which would, again, kids are usually out of the house at this point, or any sort of other arrangement, such as an open marriage or something like that, which many women, if they have zero drive, are honestly not that averse to when the guy talks about it, at least among more liberal, less religious people. But, I mean, you can always leave. There's not a gun to your head. Most happy couples, though, that love each other can figure something out. Just like if you, you know, got sick or anything, you know, that she would stay by you, hopefully. And if she didn't, then she did it. Just like you don't have to stay with her. And I talk about this a lot in my podcast, menopause and when it leads to the end of sex. So on the Dr. Psych Mom Show, it's menopause and when it leads to the end of sex. Um, and send your likes if you're watching. I'm sure I'll be up to a lot of likes, I hope, because I've been going on a long time here. Lots of free advice. Uh, Tony says, can you imagine over the past 25 years, it's been about four times a year, if lucky, acceptable or not. Reason for infidelity. There's never a reason for infidelity. I don't know why you're staying, though. I mean, 25 years, again, you should have raised your kids by now. Um, that is a sexless marriage. You are staying though so I mean I would need to know so much more than that and you were staying from the beginning so I mean there are really very few situations where there are no situations I mean unless we're talking about like she's in a coma and like I can't ask her if I can cheat or something I mean there's never a reason to be on to be you know to cheat because you could just leave like you know this is not this is not a society where we are stoned if we divorce so you know John says, there's a difference between less sex and no or next to no sex. I think it's that that's the difference with the baby analogy. Not for many, John. For, for many, there's birth trauma and there's a lot of bad shit. There's postpartum depression and it can go to no sex for, for a while. You know, but sure, there certainly is a difference. You're right between less sex and no sex. That I don't know where you're going with that, but that is true for sure. Um... Anthony said, wow, no, 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 that is crazy. Okay, sorry. I assume you're talking about the sexless marriage situation. Um, anyway, so, so yeah, hopefully you guys found this super interesting talk about uh, perimenopause, menopause, all that stuff. It's super interesting topic. And um, join my group if you really like talking to me. I engage a lot in there. I do not engage on the main page comments much. Every so often I have a spurt, but most of them I just see them come and go because people can get really aggressive on the main page. So I don't really engage there. Um, I get harassed like every single day from people on the main page that direct message me. So I try not to go much on there if I want to maintain a public presence. So you guys should join the secret group where I do engage on almost every thread. And uh, if you ever want to work with me individually, reach out. It's drsamantharodman.com or it's drpsychmom slash coaching or you can message this page because I still do take clients individually. And there's a lot of people I work with as couples and individuals. And also, um, I have my whole practice. So if you can't afford to work with me, then you can afford to work with one of my clinicians, possibly. We are all out of network, though. And that's bestlifebehavioralhealth.com. All right. Thank you so much, guys. And I will talk to everybody soon. Have an awesome weekend.